tell us about growing up. Like, where'd you grow up? I am a native of Memphis, Tennessee. I actually grew up in what is known as Fraser, North Memphis. Um, like the Watkins in 51. <laughs> so it was definitely not the best area of Memphis, but a lot of people don't know prior to probably the 80s, Fraser was the place to be there. Yes, it was where Harvester was, uh, DuPont, there was a lot of money in that area. And when those businesses left, so too did the economy, the opportunities, so. Now you talked about showing horses. Mm -hmm. How did you get into that growing up? Um, well, that starts with my oldest sister, who is 17 years older than I am. So she's 17 years older than me. My brother's 14 years older than me. Uh, the middle sister is six years older than me. And then there's me at the end. So think of Catherine, who's the one older than me, as the oops. And I was just the big oops. But Timmy got into horses because there were actually a lot of, um, call them rental barns in Fraser, And she started riding. Um, my grandmother had horses. Um, my, our cousin was my sister's best friend. They grew up riding together, and so I was four months old the first time I sat on a walking horse. And my sister rode me around, and they said I screamed when they tried to get me off, so hence the love affair. So um, between Shelby County and DeSoto County, at one point in time, there were over 20 saddle clubs. So a lot of people who are native to this area will remember Lazy W Saddle Club on Church Road. They'll remember Grayson Farm Saddle Club at the corner to Lahoma and Holmes. Uh, get well in Tullahoma. I think no get well in homes you had briarwood saddle club frontier saddle club and that's just to name the right ones next, right next to snow road yes yes uh that was sunset hill saddle club my horses were there whenever that place got sold so i've i've had to move them around quite a bit because i've never been able to have them in my backyard that's one of my dreams is to be able to do that but I don't know. we make do and we make it but uh i think i was eight or nine years old and we moved to Graceland Farm Saddle Club. And it was a huge arena, beautiful place. It had a 150 acre pasture. And so as a child, I mean, my mother would take us there after school. We might not have anything to eat and there was a water hose if we were thirsty and we just run amok. I had a wild childhood. But horses teach you a level of responsibility that you cannot fabricate with any other, to me, kind of experience. There's if you drop the ball, if you don't do what you're supposed to do with your animals, um, they suffer because of it. So it, it definitely taught me about empathy, not just for other people, but also for horses. Um, I was competitive, but not in a negative way. Like we could be running in the same class because I did barrels and poles. I had a running horse. Um, even though I was raised more in walkers, I was young and I liked the speed. So I, I liked the fast horses. Um, so squirrel moment, I forgot where I was going with that, but I loved showing and I loved riding. Um, and so we moved to Graceland Farm, not, yeah, we moved to Graceland, they had shows every Friday night and they were part of SASCA, which was the Southern Amateur Saddle Club Association. So between Shelby County and DeSoto County, all of those clubs were all competing in the same organization. So at the end of the year, there was a show of champions. So I finally got to go to a couple of those but every horse I ever owned, they were bare bottom cheap. I mean, my parents, we lived in Fraser. We did not have the, I don't, to this day, I don't know how my mother made it work, right. but she did. Um, so anything that I wanted to compete on, I had to raise it. I had to train it. I had to work it. I had to do all of that myself. So when it comes to hard work and then seeing the rewards for it, that's probably one of the greatest lessons that I took from my time with horses and showing growing up. But um, if we were competing in the same class, I would, I would holler for you. I would root for you. I wanted all of us to have a good time and to win. And so make the camaraderie of it was as a very special part of my childhood. Uh, you don't see those clubs in DeSoto County anymore because the land has become too valuable. Oh, absolutely. And probably about 15 years ago, we really started to see uh, both Memphis, and, well, Shelby County and Tennessee, like they were systematically eradicating the saddle clubs. And the issue, there's, there's been kind of a lot of changes within the horse industry in that time. Um, you know, we used to have slaughterhouses, we don't anymore. And so there's a lot of horses that end up in very terrible conditions. Um, in eradicating the saddle clubs, you have the rise of uh, boarding stables and where we could rent a stall for $20 a horse a month. And now it's four or $500 right. for to 
has to put your horse in a pasture somewhere. So luckily my sister has land. Both my sisters actually have land. And so my horses are on my oldest sister's property. What would your dream spot be? Like Marshall, something like Marshall County? I mean, you have to get out to have land anymore. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, Marshall County, Tate County, anywhere that's gonna be. I've actually lived all 38 of my years that I've been alive within four miles of Highway 51. And so I've never strayed very far from there. Um, so, but I like the the Marshall Tate southeastern corner of DeSoto County. Um, but my dream is actually to ha have enough land. Um, I like teaching, I like working with kids. If I was gonna go back to school, it would be to get a psychology degree. Um, adolescent psych and get my PhD in adolescent uh, psychology and research but I really want to have a therapy barn and I have a heart for veterans because my dad was a Vietnam War veteran I have so many military personnel in my family I'm a very strong patriot um, my dad always flew the American flag and then pound Mia underneath it um, because he the, the Vietnam War was was terrible for many reasons right Tell us about high school. What was high school like for you? Um, well, in Memphis, if you um, don't have necessarily access to a really good school, they have what's called the optional program where if you have high enough test scores and good enough behavior, your parents can apply for you to go to a school of your choice if they have the spots open. So I got to go to Central High School in Memphis and I graduated in 20, no, 20, 2004. Okay. Tell us about your college experience and how you chose to go to the college you went. Okay. Um, well, I, I kind of went back and forth. I wanted to travel and I wanted to go abroad, but I had horses and I was actively showing. So it was difficult for me to take them with me and I couldn't leave them behind and such a part of my identity. So I chose to go to the University of Memphis and I have a bachelor's degree um, in English with a concentration in writing and my minor is in philosophy because my mother raised i have two sisters and a brother she wanted one of us to be a doctor um so one of my oldest sister is actually a pharmacologist at the va in memphis um my brother went to the air force academy and he was atn pilot for a long time and and now he's working as a subcontractor out of Sumter, north carolina um the other sister we'll just call her the black sheep of the family no she's she's um She's the stubborn and bullheaded one of all of us, but in terms of growing up, I think she's one of the ones I'm most proud of. And that leaves the lawyer. So my mother was insistent that she would pay for me to go all the way through school if I would end up at Memphis Law, which people don't realize is and has been uh, one of the top two law schools in the entire country. People send their kids to Memphis for that program. And my senior year, I was trying to decide do I really want to go down that path or is there something that my heart is calling me more to and um, in thinking about that I decided to <laughs> disappoint my mother and go I was gonna stay but I got my master's in teaching it's quite a shock for her and at least twice a year she'll call me and be like oh how are you doing and we'll chit chat you ready to go back to school you ready to get that law degree um, <laughs> And so it's been in the back of my mind, I could do that, but I just can't leave teaching. I cannot leave what I'm doing because I love it too much. So your mom wanted you to be a lawyer. You ended up a teacher. You said you, you were looking for something that you felt passionate about. How, how was teaching, how did teaching strike you? And how did you come up with that decision to, to leave law and do the teaching route? Um, so I had a tumultuous childhood. Like the horses were a saving grace. That was where a lot of my family was. But being the youngest and having older parents and, and anyone who has older parents can kind of sympathize with me, but we kind of tend to be a little bit of the lost child. Our parents are tired. Um, and my oldest siblings, Timmy, who's the oldest, she was gone. She had moved out by the time I was born and my brother left when I was four. Um, and my middle sister, the, the black sheep, she was mean to me. So I didn't really have a very strong family life. And I was kind of an outcast at school. I didn't have a lot of friends. And once I got into high school, I had a couple of really good teachers. I had Mr. Moore, who was my geometry teacher. And I don't like math. Math brain doesn't work. Um, I'm too visual and kinesthetic. I really, conceptualizing information, I just, if I don't have a frame of reference for it, I don't understand it. I can't create an image without at least a certain level of imagery. And if it's mechanical, I have to see it. But 
Um, I had another really good teacher, Miss Moore. She taught biology, and she taught me that it was okay to make mistakes. And I actually learned more in her class because she gave that grace. And she was like, okay, you screwed this up, but that's okay. Here's how you're gonna fix it. And so she kept making me do things over and over again. And by the end of the year, I had the highest biology score in the entire class. And I was like, okay, so you have to fail to be able to learn. And I knew that from horses, but it's a different world and I didn't carry over that lesson from one side to the other. And then um, I actually, so I graduated from Central High School, but I got stuck at Westside High School for two years, which doesn't even exist anymore. And that's where Mr. and Mrs. Moore were. Um, and my mother finally convinced the principal at Central at that time to take me. So I got in and um, I came in at December and I remember my counselor asking me, he said, you have really high test scores. And I was like, yeah, I, I didn't really care. I mean, they, my mom cared, dad, whatever, my mom cared. And so he was like, we're gonna, I'm gonna, a woman named Carol Burnett is gonna call you and answer the phone and talk to her. And so I remember her calling and she introduced herself and she was through, at that time it was called the Memphis Prep Program. It was the, the Memphis Rotary had an investment program where they would take students with certain skills, traits, behaviors, test scores, test scores, and they would send us to college preparatory schools. I didn't know that that was a thing. So a college preparatory school was basically a high school that you pay an exorbitant amount of money to go to. It's college prep, um, but they're more like college campuses. And I went to Northfield Mount Hermon in upstate Massachusetts. I'd never been up there. I spent six weeks there. Um, <laughs> and I didn't really know what was happening, I guess. Like it was kind of fuzzy at that time. I don't really remember a whole lot, but I remember we I ended up in the equivalent to an AP English class. So I was in class from eight o'clock in the morning until noon. We had a couple hours and then I was back in class again for three or four hours in the afternoon. So it was just extremely intensive and it was only a, a really a six week program. The teacher's name was Bob Cooley. And he was so awesome. He invested so much time with us. And we had uh, notebooks where we read for an hour every night. I mean, homework was drill sergeants. You're in your dorm, you are quiet. If they come in and you are not working and asleep, they're gonna pull you out and you're gonna talk to the dean. And depending on how many times that happens, they put you on a plane and send you home. So there was, it was very rigorous, very structured, but there was just so much opportunity for learning to take place too. And halfway through the the class, we did kind of like a, a midpoint check-in. And he's like, you know, you have a terrible Southern accent and you're quite blonde. And I said, I think everybody made some assumptions about you the first time you came in and we were talking. He's like, you have proven yourself in a way that I did not anticipate. He said, I, I don't ever have someone with an A halfway through. You have a 94. And I, I am extremely impressed and I commend you for the hard work you're doing. And so dorms, right? My, my dorm mate was from Tokyo, Japan. This is an extremely affluent school. There were people from Turkey. There were people from just all the nations, but from very affluent backgrounds. So they, to say that they were different from me is, is a gross understatement. Um, but I ended up tutoring her in English and helping her with her classes. And I remember her looking at me saying, no, you're really good at this. You're really good at being able to explain this. I understand this the way that you are talking in a way that I don't understand them. And I remember talking to Mr. Cooley at the end and he said, so what are you gonna do with your life? And I said, you know, I wanna be like you. I want to inspire and uplift and, and spend time with and invest in people to change their lives and then send them out and see what good they can do. And so um, when I was doing that kind of search in my heart, what do I want to do? You never hear people talk positively about lawyers. You just, you just don't. And yes, they're intelligent. Yes, they're educated. They're manipulative. Um, they're respected, but I don't think for the right reasons. And for all the faults and flaws of my father with his experience, his, he was very, he pushed integrity. He pushed um, making sure that you present the right kind of person to the world. 
And I just, I told my mom, I cannot be a lawyer. I, I cannot do it. There's nothing about what they do that in any way is going to speak to my heart. I don't want to work the hours that they work. I'd like to get married and have kids. And that's just not conducive to what I would like my life to turn into. So she said, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I've already applied and gotten accepted into the College of Education. She was like, you're going to go be a teacher? Yes. But you're going to pay for it on your own. And I did. And I have a mortgage and student loans, but it doesn't matter. I'm, I am happy with what I chose. I don't regret it. And I wouldn't do it any other way. What do you love about Horn Lake High School? Oh, my gosh. Um, that's a complex answer because of all the moving pieces. But if I had to say, it's, you know, in, in our logo, you have the, the HL for family. And that's why I love this place, because the administrators, the support staff, the teachers, I have worked, like this is my fourth or fifth school, and I've, I've, I've seen glimpses of this kind of dynamic where things were as good as they are, but I've not seen it to this extent. And it's because we love each other and we support each other and we uplift each other and um, we try to be positive. We give grace when somebody makes a mistake and we we have accountability but it seems it, it's in a nice balance to allow people to be human and make mistakes so i love the kids um i love the staff i i, I don't know if i've told mr tungit this but i will this is where i will end i don't want to leave this is my home